is the soft chamber enough? How often would I have to go in to get benefits? Is it all at once? Is it a brief burst? Is it once a week? And this is from the pressure. It's not like I could just breathe oxygen and then stop breathing it. Should I sleep in my hyperbaric? Is there a case for breathing carbon dioxide occasionally when I'm in my hyperbaric? Fireside chat is with Dr. Jason Saunders. And you might've heard the podcast we did about hyperbarics. And this is really important because we want to do everything that works to live a long time. Thank you. Or uh, just to perform well. And I've had a hyperbaric chamber in OxyHealth for I think about 18 years now, because the evidence is so strong. And there was a study about three, four years ago coming out of Israel showing really profound differences in telomere length. So would you do it for healing the way I did like after I had a, a joint repair surgery on my foot from a yoga injury, I did a little documentary and I did hyperbaric every single day and I healed twice as fast as you're supposed to. So there's a use case there. And there's a use case for cognitive enhancement and creativity and meditation even. And there's a use case for longevity. But it drives me nuts when someone says, you should cook, but they don't say what you should cook. You should exercise. They don't say how often or what. Right? And it turns out the details matter. In fact, they matter so much that with exercise, we were able to remove 95% of the time and effort on cardio to get the same results just by having the right recipe. So there has to be the right recipe for hyperbaric to get you to where you want to go for your goals, right? So let's talk about that. Jason Saunders, come on up. All that. All right. Should I sleep in my hyperbaric? All night, every night, no. Uh, <laughs> at what pressure, how often, what's your goal? To your oh, point earlier. Who would have thought? What are you trying to accomplish? That's I want to live forever, be the smartest human on earth and have incredibly high libido. So you should fast? live in the chamber, don't ever come out, and live 150 years, but just inside the, the cabin. Oh man, the dark side of longevity. <laughs> that What a great answer though, to be, to be really uh, honest about it. Um, my goals would be longevity, cognitive function, and just having a ton of energy. And I've often thought of trying to sleep in my chamber, and I've never done it because there's fears of oxygen toxicity. Is that a thing? Oxygen toxicity is a thing. Primarily, I would say it's hard to achieve. Yeah. So, you know, depending on what pressure, what percentage of oxygen you're breathing, how long you're staying, but uh, I think eight hours is excessive, Yeah. quite honestly. Uh, usually two hours, three hours is more than enough. And actually, um, when you get in and out of the chamber, there's different, there's different benefits of being in the chamber, and there's a whole set of different benefits when you get out of the chamber. And I would okay. say that, quite honestly, the research is showing that getting out of the chamber is the most important part. So you go in the chamber to load with oxygen, you get out of the chamber to unload the oxygen, and most of the cell signaling that occurs is really from that off-gassing. So if you did three hours a day, as an example, like one hour three times a day would be, in my opinion, more effective than, let's say, a three-hour oh, wow. session. That's interesting. And this is from the pressure. It's not like I could just breathe oxygen and then stop breathing it. Yeah, no. Okay, so go up, go down. Go up, go down. So I have the hard-sided uh, oxy health chamber, and from inside that I can change the pressure. So I should basically let the air out, put it back in, like when I'm in. Well, so either, yeah. So if you've seen any of the research in hyperbarics, especially the telomere that you were talking about, we talk about air breaks all the time. Those air breaks allow you to, you know, get pressurized oxygen at a certain rate, take the mask off. You already start off-gassing. Okay. Just from that. So there's there's the off-gassing effect of the mask on and off, and then there's the off-gassing effect of going in and out. And James Nestor is a friend, um, speaking also. And he and I have both talked about breathing carbon dioxide directly. Yeah. In fact, sometimes I just do it before bed. Um, and he describes it as like a sense of impending horror and terror. And like, I just feel like <laughs> it's dizziness. Yeah. But is there a case for breathing carbon dioxide occasionally when I'm in my hyperbaric? So I wouldn't do it in the chain. So I, I use carbon dioxide okay. pretty regularly. I probably do three days a week, maybe 10, 15 minutes. I, don't, I haven't done it at night. You're doing carbogen. Yeah. Okay, got it. So I, I just breathe pure CO2, one breath, and then you're like, Ugh, Oh, no, I don't do that. Crash. <laughs> I haven't done that yet. You haven't? 
What's up? I got some backstage. You want? Oh, maybe we want to do it right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it and then see what happens for the rest of the talk. So, um, so I love carbon dioxide. I think there's a lot of okay. hormetic value to it. It is uh, because it's a vasodilator. Oxygen's a vasoconstrictor. I see use cases at lower pressures for combining the two. But quite honestly, I think hyperbaric alone has this, you know, hyperoxygenation effect followed by this off-gassing. Okay. Carbon dioxide will help drive even more of that oxygen afterwards off the red blood cells and into, you know, okay. mitochondria. So I've been playing with it mostly as a post-hyperbaric. I've had so many people come up and say, Dave, I want to buy an OxyHealth is the soft chamber enough? Right. What do you say to questions like that? So, I mean, quite honestly, you know, so I teach hyperbarics yeah. all over. The, the question I get the most is, you know, are soft chambers relevant? Do they do anything? Yeah. Are hard chambers dangerous? I hear that too. It's, is that too much? You know, where, where does this live? So um, we finally did research on it to actually start looking and asking that question. So we did a 1.3 versus 2.0. We did 50 hours of treatment over three months, essentially. And we measured cytokines, so inflammatory markers, we measured cognitive performance, and we measured a whole series of epigenetic panels. And we found both work. Oh, but, soft and hard work. So both soft and hard work, but they work differently. In other words, um, memory, cognitive performance improved across the board, but memory was the most impacted, both in soft and hard. Okay, so if you want to be smarter, a soft chamber is plenty. Is plenty. Okay. If you wanted to reduce inflammation, both pressures reduced inflammation systemically, mm -hmm. but low pressure affected certain cytokines that high pressure didn't, and high pressure affected certain cytokines that low pressure didn't. So if you have an issue, if you're just trying to lower systemic inflammation, I would say either one would work. If you knew you had something wrong, you could actually do some cytokine testing now and actually identify where your areas of issue are, and you might actually start building protocols even just based on that information. Wow, and you could probably do that with AI. They could take the study that you have, it's on your website? Yep. Okay, and it's Dr, what, what's your website? Uh, HBOTUSA. HBOTUSA.com, so you can go there, look at the thing, you could literally dump it into your favorite AI and say, hey, I have these cytokine panels, look at what pressures do what, and it would tell you, right? Working on my own, uh, AI agent. Oh, really? So then we'll be able to, when is that coming out? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know okay, how to do like it. I'm to build it help. my phone right now. Yeah. <laughs> You're going to help me build it. This is really cool because we just talked this morning about meditation and consciousness. So we talked yesterday about electrical signaling in the body and heart rate variability. Now we're talking about the mix of gases we breathe and the pressure at which we breathe them and the pattern, the frequency of all this happening. And so there's this common thread. If we just know what to do with all of the environment around us, the signals coming to our body, if you do this, it changes this. But if you don't know if you have this, you don't know. So what's the name of the cytokine panel test or what's your favorite lab? How does that work? So, I mean, the one we used for uh, our research was like only a research only lab. You know, okay. so we did 71 different cytokines. We found- oh, that's a lot. We found 21 of them to be uh, significant in low pressure. We found 20 to be significant in high pressure. Wow. Um, but there's, a, there's quite a few, I don't know if you include any cytokines specifically in the panel that you were talking about. We probably, off the top of my head, we probably use IL-6. Yeah, so interleukin-6 was more affected by, so interleukin-6, TNF-alpha and TNF-beta, which are sort of three of the most common in chronic mm -hmm. illness, those were all affected uh, far more from lower pressure than they were from, from lower pressure. pressure. Yeah. So it sounds like for most of the time, a uh, low pressure uh, hyperbaric, which is something that is more common uh, in clinics and you can get in your living room behind your couch um, if you want to. It's within, it's less than a car. It, it's under $20,000, but it's not free, but your whole family can use it and your whole neighborhood can right. use it. So you know, maybe you want to do it, maybe you don't. But if you have that, you're going to get most of the benefits. And if you have specific medical conditions, is it like speed healing to go to higher pressures? Yeah, you know, I, I think you can get certain things accomplished faster, let's say at higher pressures than lower pressures. If you're committed to the journey, okay. you're using it on a regular basis, I think, like you said, you can really utilize like a soft okay. mild chamber and, and get there over time. There are a lot of practitioners in the room who maybe have a chamber in their clinic. Um, there's ATX Hyperbarics is here. Hopefully, yeah. I'm sure Clay runs that. And what if you're just a normal, normal person saying, like, I really don't want to replace my couch with hyperbarics? <laughs> Although why you wouldn't, I don't know, man. Well, but you could replace your bed and sleep in it. Replace your bed, there you go, <laughs> Michael Jackson style. How often would I have to go in 
to get benefits? And is it all at once? Is it a brief burst? Is it once a week? Like, tell me the consumer pattern of usage if you don't own a chamber. So there's, there's a couple ways to answer that. The first I would just say simply, um, it's a time commitment. You know, if you do two or three sessions over the course of two or three years, or even two or three months, like, you'll just never get the benefit you're looking for. So if you really want some of the long-term benefits, you're gonna have to commit to some type of 20, 30 hour program. 20 or 30 hours over- Over the course of like, let's say two or three months. Okay, only 20 or 30, because Dr. Harch was saying 40 well, hours. So 40 is kind of like the research okay. hallmark, but I would say most of these changes really start around session 15 or 16. Over what period of time? Over the course month? of like a month, month and a half. Okay, so, so basically- Double that, you can really set those in motion. So there's, there's, two, there's, two component, there's two completely different pathways of hyperbaric. One is it drives oxygen into the mitochondria, it creates more cellular energy, it upregulates your immune system function, and it lowers inflammation. Okay. So like oxygen as a molecule and a nutrient, it'll do that at every pressure, almost every session. But then it also acts as a, a cell signaling molecule and it changes the epigenome dramatically. Ooh. And that's a lot of what the research was about. And we saw that lower pressure affected the epigenome in one way, higher pressure affected the epigenome in another way. There was no overlap whatsoever. So wow. what mild pressure did to our epigenetics and what high pressure did to the epigenetics was completely individual to the pressure. So what that started to tell me was, listen, you could utilize hyperbaric on a regular basis. If you started to solve for mitochondrial issues and inflammatory issues, you're already making a huge dent in all of the chronic illness you know, variables. Incredible. But then if you exposed yourself to different pressures throughout the course, and you could do, you know, 1.3 at home, go to a clinic and do 10 sessions at 2.0, you know, it doesn't have to be, and it shouldn't be, the same pressure over and over again. We have to create a variety of pressure. The same way, you know, variety in your exercise, variety in your meditation, variety in your diet. Yeah. It, there's variety in pressure, and especially from an epigenetic standpoint, that variety is critically important. So you're, you're proposing that maybe you make an appointment for 30 appointments with a local hyperbaric chamber over a relatively short period of time? Yeah. Is one per day okay? More than enough, yeah. Was, okay. I, even three or four. So the study I did, I purposely did it at three times a week because okay. most of the studies that have been done in hyperbarics have been done at five days a week. And while we do get a lot of patients who will come five days a week, that's pretty inconvenient for most people. And so I wanted to say, can I move the needle at three a week? And the answer was yes, you know? And so could I have moved the needle more at five a week? Probably, but I also don't wanna waste anybody's time and money in our clinic. So if I could do it at three and that's right. their max, at least we know we're having the impact. Is this like a once a year thing? You should do 30 sessions once a year, once every two years? You know, you're talking to somebody who obviously loves hyperbaric and thinks it's pretty important. Um, I've probably done thousands of hours, literally over 20 years that I've been doing hyperbaric. But I would say that most of my use at this point, you have to go through some loading phases at least to get some of those, some, the momentum cellularly. And then you can go into some type of maintenance program. That could be once a week, it could be once or twice a month. But really where I see the most benefit is I do clusters. So I do about 30 to 40 hours, three to four times a year. Three to four times a year, so you're hardcore but, there. But that's, you know, I don't think that's requirement for health and longevity, but I have one in my house, I do it regularly, and I believe you know, there's other issues, like I'm not solving for any problems, but I have a lot of dementia in my family, as mm. an example. So, you know, I see that this is a tool as a preventative measure. Is there a, like a Latin term for hyperbaric fetishism? <laughs> I'm, I think we should invent that. Let's we'll get it in a dictionary. And... So, but what I find, it, and I love this, is when you find someone who's really mastered a technique or a technology or a mechanism, it's like, this is the thing. And then you're always gonna be the most extreme to learn all the stuff and then you share it. So those of us are like, okay, I wanna do that and I wanna do this, but you, you've distilled so much knowledge, especially with the recent study that we covered on the podcast. I really feel like it's, it's worth sharing because if you have brain fog, maybe you had long COVID or you've had mold. How many people have toxic mold in here? Like it's yeah. probably five times more hands should go up than did go up. You just don't know it. And you're wondering what's going on. What does hyperbaric do for mold? I mean, so hyperbaric has two effects on the immune system. One, it reduces inflammation again, systemically. And two, it upregulates your body's immune system's ability to fight infection, especially with chronic mold. You know, these people are, are pretty much immune compromised at some point. Yeah. And so fighting the fight over and over again for years and years, 
you know, it really depletes the system. So being able to fuel the immune system, your, your white blood cells use reactive oxygen species to actually fight infection. And so by building that up in the system, it's literally arming the white blood cells with the ingredient that they'll use to help kill that infection. So to lower the inflammatory response and upregulate the ability to fight infection, and that's true for bacteria, viruses, it's for true everything. for mold. Yeah, I mean, so okay. you use it for mold all the time. Some people use like a pre-workout stack. Yeah. My pre-hyperbaric stack is uh, Danger Coffee because I know what the minerals in here do for cell electrical capacity. And oftentimes I'll either use MCT or ketones. Yeah. Anything else that you'd recommend or am I doing something I shouldn't do before I go in? No, I love that. Um, we do a lot. Of, so it, again, depends on the goal, right? So you could have like an inflammatory or an anti-inflammatory stack. You could have a mitochondrial stack. You could have a detox stack, right? Performance stack. So if I was looking at mitochondrial and, and performance, I'd say, you know, uh, upregulating ketones in, in whatever way you do that. And that might include going in fasted and, yeah. you know, with MCT, let's say. Uh, it could also include doing some NAD before going in or NAD precursors, okay. depending on what, you know, that's like the precursor of the fuel that goes into the mitochondria. It's some qualia NAD or... Totally, yeah. Methylene blue, which we know is a major activator of mitochondria, especially the electron transport of mitochondria. So, you know, some NAD, some methylene blue, some red light, which is going to stimulate cytochrome C, also part of that energy production pathway and then oxygen to so like, I mean, you're almost hitting, if you did something like that, you're literally hitting every single one of, or add, add CoQ10 to that if you want, but it's every single rate limiting step to mitochondrial function. And you could just stack them all and go right in. That is really actionable advice. And I, I really wanna thank you for going in and answering questions that have lingered for 30 years yeah. of hyperbaric. The things that your recent study really. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for sharing the results. Maybe you just bought your first chamber or you're thinking about buying your first chamber. Maybe that's a home use chamber or perhaps you're considering offering hyperbaric inside your clinic. And if you're anything like me when I first started, you're realizing how much information there is out there and you're concerned, are you doing this the right way? Are you being safe? How am I gonna utilize this hyperbaric chamber in the most effective way possible? If you're just getting involved in hyperbarics and you're looking for an introductory training program, the basic hyperbaric technician program is exactly what you need. In this course, we're gonna cover how does hyperbaric work? Why does hyperbaric work? What makes hyperbaric oxygen such a unique therapy? What mechanisms of action are taking place? What are the benefits of hyperbaric, both short and long-term? And what types of indications are appropriate to utilize hyperbaric for? We will also help build your confidence, not only in how to utilize the therapy, but how to talk about this therapy with patients or with other healthcare providers that may not understand hyperbarics the way you will once you finish this course. So if you're ready to dive in, click the link below this video and let's get started.